We start with Travis Walton himself, here in our Washington studio. Thousands of Americans claim they've had a terrifying UFO experience. Many such stories fall apart under scientific scrutiny. But this one impresses a lot of people. This is Sitgreaves National Forest. Located in northern Arizona, its trees cover over 2 million acres of land. But on November 5th, 1975, it became the location of one of the most well-documented alien abduction cases ever. Picture a night much like this, quiet, serene, seemingly ordinary. But on this particular night, reality itself would be shattered, giving rise to a mystery that still haunts the minds of those who dare to explore it. This is the case of Travis Walton, an alien encounter that'll leave you questioning the very fabric of our existence. Existence. It all started when a seven-man crew of lumberjacks were hired to go and cut down a large section of trees deep inside the forest. Now, on the day of the incident, the guys were running a little behind pace for their deadline to get the job done. Here is Mike Rogers, his friend and a witness to the incident. I was the crew boss, and I hired Travis and several other guys. Travis was my best friend. As soon as the sun came up, all seven men packed into one truck and drove out to the remote site they'd been working at, where they planned to stay all the way until sunset. Now, aside from the overtime, this day was was fairly usual, except for the fact that Mike Rogers, the crew boss, and Travis Walton were butting heads all day. Usually they were best friends, but a few days before, they had gotten into a heated argument which caused tensions to be high even at work. He had gone out to see this girlfriend of mine, so we got in a fight over that. But despite their differences, they were able to work all day until it was literally too dark to see anything, and that's when all the guys crammed back into the truck and started driving back out of the forest. Now, because they were so deep inside, they didn't expect to see any except for the occasional hunter. That's why they were very confused when they saw that right off the road as they were driving out was a bright light that was coming through the trees. I hadn't driven very far when we caught glimmers of this glow coming through the trees. Confused, nobody had any idea what this could be. You don't normally see any light at all out in the woods at night. It wasn't headlights because they were too bright. One guy thought it might be the moon, but that wasn't true because the moon was clearly visible in another part of the sky. And that's somewhere saying, well, maybe it's a plane crash, but I'm looking at it, you know, and it's, it's not a plane crash. And it almost looked like it could have been a forest fire, but that didn't make sense either because it almost looked like the light was coming from above the ground. It's kind of like light shining through a lampshade. It's kind of yellowish glow to it. I mean, that's what it appeared to me. That's why Mike Rogers decided to turn the truck and start going towards the lights just to check out what was going on. And as they got within a few hundred feet, they noticed the trees start to open up into a clearing. And when we broke into the clearing, there it was. In the middle of the clearing was a very bright saucer-shaped object that was glowing, not making any noise, and hovering just above the ground. It was so smooth, it was metallic, it was both giving off light and reflecting light at the same time. <laughs> At this moment, nearly every guy froze, not knowing exactly how to process what they were looking at. Except for Travis, who, without hesitation, jumped out of the truck and started running towards this thing at a full sprint. Uh, you know, I just wanted to see it up close, not real close. <laughs> I was actually assuming that it would take off. Now, maybe it was the emotional state he was in given their recent fight with his best friend, or maybe it was the raging hormones pulsing through his 22-year-old body. But either way, Travis kind of had this reputation of being a little bit of a daredevil because literally the week before the crew had seen a bear in the woods and Travis sprinted at the thing to scare it off. And now Travis found himself running directly at this flying saucer showing no fear. It was a rather impulsive thing to do and I was regretting it almost as quickly as I did it. As he got closer to this thing, it wasn't moving, and he started to hear this high-pitched humming noise that was coming from the craft, almost like an electrical buzz. It was just such an intense sound where the lows were something you really felt more than heard, and the highs were kind of like something that was like inside your head rather than coming through your ear. I mean, the guys in the truck were even feeling this vibration too. When my hands were on the steering wheel, I could feel it, and my elbow was on the window, I could feel it through that because it started getting more intense louder and more volume and this started to spook travis so that's why he jumped down into a crouching position now almost directly under the craft and that's when his fight or flight response kicked in so he stood up to try to run away from this thing but as soon as he stood up a bright beam of light shot out of the craft and hit travis bam that's when it hit me turned my head the other way and then the woods all lit up a bluish green and when i look back he's a few feet off the ground and stretched out like this 
All six men who were still in the truck watched in horror as they thought this thing had just killed their friend Travis. So without hesitation, Mike floored the gas pedal and peeled off in the other direction. And after they had gotten a few miles away, the guys were still freaking out until they saw that whatever this bright craft was, it zipped off into space at breakneck speed. So they started to gather their thoughts a little bit. And one of the guys was like, yo guys, we have to go back and get Travis. We can't just leave him there. Finally, I just said, I'm going back. You can stay here or get in the truck. And how I was surprised that they all got in the truck. Because if there was a small chance that Travis was still alive, he wouldn't survive the night. It simply got too cold at that time of the year in Northern Arizona, meaning that if the craft didn't kill him, the hypothermia would have. So Mike turned the truck around and started driving back towards this clearing. And when they got there, they expected that they would find Travis's body laying somewhere on the ground. And much to their surprise, not only was the craft gone, but Travis Walton was too. Not knowing what to do, they did the only thing that seemed right. They drove right back into town, went to the police station, and told the local sheriff, Chuck Ellison, what happened. They were obviously very upset about something. And I said, what do you mean they got Travis? Tell me what you mean they got Travis. According to their story, they turned around and went back. Travis was not there. Put yourself in Ellison's shoes for a second. You're working in a small town of Snowflake, Arizona, that's so small, basically everybody knows everybody. And in the middle of the night, six young guys come up to you and tell you this crazy story about seeing a flying saucer in the woods and seeing it zap their best friend and then take him off into space. I mean, I'm a conspiracy theorist and even I would have a hard time believing that story. And I tried to get just as close to each one of them as I could to see if I could detect odors of marijuana or or alcohol or anything like that. So rather than taking their story at face value, Ellison started to think that maybe these guys killed their friend and dumped his body in the woods somewhere. So he almost started to treat this like a murder investigation. If somebody is out here that's reportedly missing, I need to find that person. The first step, they need to go out to the clearing and investigate the scene and hopefully find Travis's body. That's when he called the Navajo County Sheriff, the dog handlers from the Arizona State Prison, and gathered as many people as he could to form a search party to go out there and look for Travis's body somewhere. And after searching all night and the entire next day, they found nothing. We never found a footprint or a sign anywhere of Travis Walton. Assuming there must have been foul play of some sort, Ellison started to tell the guys, listen, if you just tell us what happened and tell us where Travis is, we can end this whole thing right now. Because regardless of how adamant these guys were about their story and what happened with his craft, he simply couldn't bring himself to believe them. He says that he didn't believe us or disbelieve us. You know, he was just being neutral. The police had to look at the much more obvious real world possibility that one way or another, Travis lost his life and the body was hit. And he was determined to get his version of the truth out of these guys one way or another. Sir, I'm not here to determine if this is a hoax. I'm here to determine if law has been broken. So he called a guy named Cy Gilson, who was the number one polygrapher in the state of Arizona, to come and put these guys under a lie detector test to figure out what might have actually happened to Travis. I designed the questions. The entire test is established by research from a Dr. Raskin out of the University of Utah, who done many, many years of research on its validity and its accuracy. The very next day, Gilson showed up to town and interrogated each one of the crew members one by one, starting with Steve Pierce, because at 17 years old, he was the youngest guy in the group, so they figured that because he was the youngest, he would be the easiest one to crack. Someone like that is more likely to admit that it's a sham, so he's the one I wanted to choose first, because if it was a sham, it would save a lot of time and effort on my part and everybody else. I was scared to death. I figured I was going to flunk it because all week long, I've been hearing, well, they're going to set it up to make you guys look guilty. Each polygraph session took about two hours where the guys were asked the same four questions over and over again. Did you murder Travis Walton? Was Travis harmed by some guy in the group? Did you see a flying saucer? Did this flying saucer hit Travis with a bright beam of light? And after questioning each one of the guys, much to his surprise, they all passed with flying colors. Frankly, when I finished with him, I was quite surprised myself because he was passing the exam. But despite this result, nobody was prepared for what happened next. Thanks. Late in the evening on November 10th, five days after the entire town of Snowflake, Arizona started accusing six men of murdering Travis Walton, Travis Walton opened his eyes and found himself lying on his back in the middle of the road. The first thing he saw when he looked up were bright lights coming off the bottom of this flying saucer that was hovering 20 feet above him. Then suddenly, it shot off like a bullet into space. Right, and I can see a light. 
on the bottom of a of a flying saucer and it just went straight up really fast without a sound. There wasn't a person in sight, but Travis looked around and he noticed that there were some phone booths right up the road. So he made his way over there and used the spare change that was still in his pocket to call his brother Dwayne. He answered and said, who is this? And I tried to tell him and he said, I think you got the wrong number and he started to hang up. And Dwayne, who would be getting prank calls all week because his brother was maybe murdered or maybe abducted by aliens, assumed this was another one of those calls, so he was like, yo, this is not a joke, don't call here again. I was screamed at him that, you know, it was me, and, and so he, he stopped and he, he said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll get somebody to, to, to come and get you. So he jumped in his car and drove to Heber, Arizona, where Travis was, where he found Travis sitting on the ground inside the phone booth leaning against the wall. Travis was extremely terrified, extremely weak, and also had about five days of beard growth. I was thinking this was still the same night, and he said, Travis, feel your face. And I reached up and felt that I had a five-day growth of beard, and, uh, you know, that came as really a terrible shock. So using a fake name, he checked Travis into the ER. We had him checked by uh, a couple of MDs and they, they ran some tests. I don't have all the results, but I can say this, that there was uh, urine analysis done on the, the first urine sample after the incident, and this completely does away with the idea that there was any drug involvement that some people brought up. Uh, that and the blood samples really straighten that out. And upon getting him examined, the doctors who were familiar with the story had found that Travis lost about 12 pounds in the five days he was gone. And he also had this weird puncture mark on the inside of his arm that couldn't be explained. So they tried to ask Travis, Travis, like, what happened to you? Where have you been? And when Travis, who was in a catatonic state, could calm down and gather his thoughts for a little bit, he was able to tell them, I was in the forest with the guys. We saw a flying saucer and the next thing I knew I was laying in the street. When I did hear that Travis had been returned, it was almost as unbelievable as the real thing. I just looked at my mom and says, I told you we didn't kill him. And from the way that Travis was talking, they could tell that he thought it was still the same day. So they broke the news to Travis. Travis, you've been missing for five days. Do you have lots of memories of those five days? Not a lot. Uh, actually, less than 20 minutes. The next day, the story of Travis's return made international headlines. Because what started off as a murder investigation had now just become a hoax investigation. And by the next day, this tiny town of Snowflake, Arizona, had become flooded with UFO enthusiasts and reporters from every news outlet. The first night, I laid down in bed in the phone rang. It did not stop till daylight. Right. I was called by Canada. I was called by England. I was called by Japan. I was called by Russia. I was called by several Asian countries. I was called, call, 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 all night long. But the truth is, Travis was in no shape to be doing any interviews because he was still trying to process the probably very traumatic experience he just went through. It was just too traumatic. They didn't even have the term post-traumatic stress disorder in those days, you know? And any time that people would try to ask him, hey, what happened while you were gone? What happened while you were on this alien ship, as soon as he would start trying to recall the memories, he would start stressing out and have a panic attack. The media scrutiny was so intense. Once it was even suspected that when my brother was involved, the reporters were knocking on the door there constantly. When we went to leave the hospital, and somebody yelled out, there he is, and they chased us into traffic. Either way, to come to the bottom of what may have actually happened, if there was any foul play, if this was a hoax, the sheriff still needed to get Travis's statement of what happened. So he decided to once again take matters into his own hands by ordering Travis to undergo a lie detector test of his own. But at the time this test was scheduled, Travis never showed up. He was scheduled to take an examination with me at our office in Phoenix at the time. He never showed up for it. But I think it's more Dwayne's influence rather than his that he didn't show up. Something that looked awfully suspicious to anybody who was a skeptic of the story. I was in such a fragile condition that my brother made all these decisions. I didn't even talk to him or discuss these things with him, tell him what I wanted, whether I would do this interview or do that or anything. I was, you know, not in that kind of shape. He even talked to a few psychologists that informed him the test itself doesn't measure lies versus truth. It only measures stress levels inside the body. I advise him not to because what it actually measures is stress. And questions about stressful memories would bring stress reactions, so it would have been to uh, have him take that test at the time. It would have 
created a lot of false impressions. So that's when a group called the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization, or APRO, reached out to Travis's brother to offer resources and help. And one of the first things they did was they offered for Travis to undergo hypnotic regression therapy. That way he could be able to clearly recall these memories without experiencing any of the anxiety and stress of the moment. The whole process of hypnosis is a sort of a deep relaxation at the same time you're confronting this, these memories. Now, obviously, there's always going to be some debate on exactly how accurate hypnotic regressions are, with skeptics always claiming that false memories could be implanted. But you've got to remember, Travis already had a lot of these memories, and all the hypnosis would do would put him into a deep state of relaxation. That way, he could actually verbalize these memories without having a panic attack. I was able to recant count the memories for the first time in their entirety without so much of the fear that was just keeping me from even speaking without breaking down. So Travis and Dwayne decided to go through with it. The session was taped. It was observed by two psychiatrists. You know, everything was properly conducted. And during this session, here's what Travis Walton said happened to him while on this alien spaceship. When I regained consciousness, I, I was in a lot of pain. I, I couldn't, I couldn't quite bring myself totally awake. After getting hit with the bright beam, Travis was knocked unconscious. And when he came to, he found that he was laying on a metal table with a bright light shining over his face. I was looking up at a light shining down on me from the ceiling. I could tell I was leaning up on a, on a bed or a table or something because the ceiling was close. He then looked around and noticed that three humanoid looking beings were standing directly over him. And I saw two men le leaning over me. They, were, they, were, they weren't really men. They were a lot like, uh, uh, they were a lot like men, but they weren't quite human and they were dressed in kind of a brownish orange they had large black almond shaped eyes their skin was gray and their faces were devoid of any emotion that's when one of them noticed that travis had woken up and he started to alert the other two beings freaked out travis jumped off the table and grabbed the first object he could get his hands on and i grabbed up a, a, a tube a clear piece of glass or something and I, I tried to break off the end to get something sharp to, to defend myself with it. What scared Travis the most is that despite how confrontational he'd become, these beings were completely non-reactive to him. They just looked at him and then they started walking towards the edge of the room where the wall opened up to a door, slid open, they walked out and then it slid shut behind them. They didn't try to approach or, or anything, they just left. They just ran out real fast. And uh, I was alone there for several minutes and I, I couldn't catch my breath. It was, it was very hot. Now that he was alone, he was able to catch his breath for a second and start assessing the scene. He started looking around, but nothing seemed even remotely familiar to him. Everything was so foreign, so alien. And aside from the table and the door, he couldn't make sense of any of it. Um, uh, I, I was leaning. I couldn't stand up very well. I'm, I was breathing very heavily, and I was afraid they'd come back. A few minutes later, the sliding door on the wall opened back up again, and now there were two human beings standing there with spacesuits and a helmet on. And when I say human, I mean they looked like normal human beings, people like you and I, except they had bright blonde hair and blue eyes, almost Nordic looking in appearance. I heard somebody come in. And I turned around and it was a man just ex just just like people. I mean, he, he wasn't like the other uh, creatures or whatever at all. He, he looked just like you and I, except he had a, a, a helmet on, a sort of a, a clear helmet. And in his confused state, Travis just assumed that, oh my God, this is the military. They're finally here to save me. Like help has finally come. So without a second thought, he ran over to them. But as soon as he got closer to them, he noticed that something seemed off. Uh, so I started babbling questions to him. I ran over there and he wouldn't, he wouldn't answer me. 
he just took me by the arm and, and wanted me to go with him. I thought he maybe he can't hear me through the helmet. Now, in that moment, Travis assumed that because they were wearing helmets, maybe they just couldn't hear him through the helmet. And when they left the room, Travis now found that they were in some hallway of some sort, but the hallway itself was relatively small, almost as if it was meant for someone much smaller than Travis. And as they were walking through this craft, they passed many rooms, eventually coming to what looked like a large hangar of some sort that was housing multiple of these saucer-shaped crafts that him and the other guys had seen in the forest. He could also see that they they were definitely in space because through the windows of one of the rooms they passed, he could clearly see stars in the background. I was trying to get this, this man to tell me what, what, you know, I asked him if he was from Earth and just anything I could think of and, and he wouldn't answer. He gestured and, and, and smiled, but I, there was no words. Then eventually these two beings led Travis to a room where another sliding door opened up for them and inside the room were three more of these human looking Nordic beings, except these ones weren't wearing a helmet at all. I was led down the hallway, the man sat me in a chair and in a room with three other people that were like himself. They were dressed in blue. The beings then brought Travis into the middle of the room and forced him down onto another metallic table of some sort. Then one of the beings put some sort of a gas mask over his face and he lost consciousness. They put a, a deal over my face. It was kind of like an oxygen mask thing. It was kind of clear plastic and it had a round black thing on it about that big just attached to it. And that was the last I remembered. I, I went to sleep. And the next thing he knew, he was on the street lying on his back looking up at this flying saucer. Are you saying, Phil, that all seven of these people are lying? I'm afraid we have to say that on the basis of physical evidence. Meaning? Physical evidence that should have been there. Why are you laughing, Travis? Well, because this is typical of the sort of reasoning pattern this man uses in attacking all UFO cases. Uh, he's equating the absence of evidence to be the evidence of absence. That's absurd, you know, and that, that's uh, actually a logical fallacy. Now, keep in mind that in our normal day-to-day -day lives, seven separate eyewitnesses, all with the exact same story, is enough evidence to convict someone of murder. But despite Travis's story lining up perfectly with the other six crew members, many people still had their doubts. So a few months later, Travis agreed to finally take a lie detector test of his own, which was also funded by APRO. All seven crew members took tests and like before, all passed with flying colors. If you only had the evidence of the, the polygraph, you, you still have the most well-documented case in UFO history. Then 42 years later, in 2017, during the filming of a documentary about Travis's experience, Travis agreed to take a film crew along with some researchers out to the actual site where the abduction took place, the location of which had been kept secret for all these years just to preserve any physical evidence if there was any. And much to their surprise, they found some very compelling physical evidence that may prove this case once and for all. What they found was that in the clearing where this flying saucer had been hovering, all the trees in the area had very abnormal growth patterns, which were visible to the naked eye on various tree stumps. It's been so many years since the original incident that we really did not expect to find anything there. But while we were on the site, a discovery was made. You see, on the rings of these trees, which signify every year of the tree's life, the side of the tree that was facing where the craft had been had fibers that were growing at about 36 times the normal rate when compared to the previous 85 years, indicating that at some point in these trees' life cycle, something had exposed it to some sort of stimuli that would cause these trees to grow like this. Even more intriguing was the directionality of the growth patterns on these trees. I found one stump that had the thickened rings in the direction back towards where the craft had been. They found that the accelerated ring growth was only happening on the side of the tree that had apparently been facing this craft, and the further away you got from the center, the less severe these abnormal growth patterns. There was a swelling and a thickening of the growth rings in the direction that the craft had been, and not on its opposite side. That was where the thickness of the rings were at the minimum. Ben Hansen, who was one of the researchers on the scene that day, decided to do some digging of his own by seeing if something like high levels of radiation could account for the way these trees were growing. And much to his surprise, the data backed up this theory. I took that a step further and, and did some digging to see if there's been any academic studies done on radiation and tree growth, and I found at least one or two related to the Chernobyl incident. According to studies that were done in 
Chernobyl, the site of the catastrophic nuclear disaster in Ukraine, the same exact type of growth patterns were shown on the trees that were exposed to the nuclear radiation. A university out of Poland did a study in 1997 that found trees that were exposed to radiation after Chernobyl had grown up to three times in volume of accelerated growth as compared to previous years. And even more puzzling, John Goulet, who was one of the crew members in the truck that night, later developed aggressive skin cancer on the side of his arm that was hanging out of the window facing the craft when Travis had run up to it. So as far as physical evidence goes, the story checks out, which leads to the question, why would Travis get abducted in the first place? Well, according to Travis, who's literally had the last 48 years to contemplate this question, he believes that he was taken in an effort to be revived. At first, I accepted the idea that I had been fired upon, but I've had a lot of years to think about it, and just the fact that I was returned at all says a lot in their favor. You see, when Travis got struck by this bright beam and lost consciousness, it's likely that this beam was just the electrical field surrounding this craft. And when he ran up to it and got too close, it's likely that he was simply electrocuted due to his proximity to the hovering saucer. So when the crew fled the scene, chances are he was already dead or close to it. And when he regained consciousness, it's likely just just because the ETs revived and healed him. So after all these years, Travis has actually reframed this memory in his head to something positive, knowing that these beings, whatever they are and wherever they're from, wanted him to live. Because without their help, not only would he have not survived, but the rest of the crew probably would have been convicted of first degree murder with such an outrageous story. It's a net negative, you know? We lost our jobs in the immediate aftermath of it. Now, here's the craziest part of all this. The moment Travis got out of the truck on that fateful night, his life has never been the same. He's always struggled to make a living. I mean, who would want to hire the guy who sees aliens on the job? And he's never been able to build a legacy for himself that doesn't involve getting abducted by aliens. You know, if I could just get this off my back any way I could, not just clam up, but just tell him, oh yeah, we were all drunk that day, you know? Even though it's a lame and silly thing to say, and it wouldn't fit with any of the facts, the people who were so anxious to hear something like that would latch onto it and leave us alone. I actually met the guy once at a restaurant in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm a pretty bold guy, so I approached him and made light conversation, and I don't remember exactly what I said, but I asked him a question, and I'll never forget how he responded to me. He looked me square in the eyes, standing two feet away from me. His eyes were exhausted, bloodshot, deadpan, and he said, to be honest, man, I just wish this whole thing never happened to me. I tell people, in spite of the fact that I've come to terms with it, even now, I'd rather it never happened, you know? But hold on to your tinfoil hats because the rabbit hole goes deeper. Travis Walton's encounter is often referred to today as one of the most famous close encounters of the fourth kind. But what many people don't know is that a full decade before Travis's experience, a UFO landed in New Mexico where two beings were seen in broad daylight walking around this mysterious craft by a police officer who was so shaken up, he immediately went to church to pray. This would go on to not just become the first, but also the best documented close encounter of the third kind in US history. And it was so mysterious, it changed J. Allen Hynek, the face of Project Blue Book, from UFO to bunker to UFO believer. And I break down the entire story of what happened in this video right here. Go check it out.